everyone. Welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. We're very excited that you all are here. Soon we're going to have a, we're going to have to put a screen out outside so that people can we'll do like they do at the opera and have performances outside and people, we'll put lawn chairs out there and people can <laughs> come and listen to our lectures. Welcome and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Leslie Bolin. I'm the director of the museum. I think I know most of you, but a few new faces. It's always nice to meet new people. Um, I a couple of we have a sort of a couple of things to go through right at the uh, beginning of our uh, program. One is that we are in the process of applying for accreditation um, and we have to provide lists here. I think most everybody here knows how this works. Um, anyway, if you would fill out your name and contact information and how you heard about the lecture, that would be um, super. Thank you very much, Bert. Here. We'll do this. Right there. Great. Um, well, I want, we have a really amazing, incredible lecture tonight and a fabulous topic, and we're very excited about it. I wanted to remind everyone a couple of things. Um, we got a new member tonight. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone is not a member and would like to join, we have uh, brochures at the door with some information about our memberships. We also have some postcards that you're welcome to take and send to other people and encourage them to join the museum, which is good. Um, and we have, uh, coming uh, on, um, Thursday, September 24th, we have a luncheon lecture. And that's this is a, kind of our first daytime event during the week. Uh, a little bit challenging because of parking, which I know it's kind of hard to fathom that considering our current situation this evening, but daytime is a little bit more difficult. So the only issue here is that there is par paid parking will be available at the building just down the street. If you go straight on Dorrington and you kind of just dead end into it, um, it's $4 per hour. Um, and we're providing lunch. So if anyone is <coughs> able to, to attend, that would be great. Um, the, the topic is Leopoldville, a tragedy too long secret. And it's um, the writer Alan Andrade, who is uh, very well known, and, and this is kind of an unusual thing for us, but we're gonna give it a, a go, and anyone that would like to come, there's a flyer on your, I think. Um, before we get started, I want to show you all, I think last time some of you all saw our video about our new museum, but just in case we have some more show and tell, I didn't want to take the time away to, but I wanted to at least show you this is our new, the new museum. Um, we have a video on buildhnm.com. If you go to that, you can take a look and see. And Bert, if you turn around, you can see the back of the building. <laughs> Here we go. Anyway, we're very excited. And um, the video, like I said, you, if you go to buildhnm.com, you can see a little bit more information about our new museum. So, how soon is construction going to start? We hope to break ground <coughs> in the spring, so probably April. And it's we're just waiting year. for your check. <laughs> um, but we are in the deep in the in the. It's you know trying to build anything. Well, trying to build anything is a complicated thing, but building <coughs> something on the port, the port is even more complicated. Um, and let's see, another lecture I'm going to tell you about next month's lecture as well. Eric, where's Eric? He's here. Oh, he's, okay. Well, we have Visions of the Bay, The Bayou, Our World, and Beyond by Eric Young, who is also one of our docents and just a fabulous member of our team. And he will be here next month. Um, so be sure to put that on your calendar. All right. Well, here we go. I want to say about Bert, this could be a long introduction, but I don't want to take away from his time. Bert Reckles has been involved with the museum uh, since really almost the beginning. Um, he is ex just a, a wealth of information. Anything you need to know, you can ask Bert. If he doesn't know, he will find out or make it up. And <laughs> he, um, he is a master uh, modeler, a, a um, miniaturist, which we have a case at the bit, at, at sort of almost all the way down behind the speaker. We have a number of Bert's models on there. He's recognized all over the world uh, for his miniatures. And um, we are very, very privileged and honored that he is a docent here and a volunteer and a board member. And so I would like to introduce you to Bert Reckles. And there you go. Thank you. First, thank you all for coming. Uh, it looks like it's just about a full house. So Leslie says, you can do another lecture because you seem to draw them in. Uh, so let me start. Last November, my wife Riva and I journeyed to Austin to see the LaSalle LaBelle exhibit at the Bullock Museum. I was so intrigued 
by this story that I told our museum staff that I would love to do a lecture on the subject, which I considered an epic tale of adventure, history, exploration, discovery, and death, with more bizarre twists and turns than a Hollywood blockbuster. And with that as a teaser, let me begin my tale by telling you about La Salle, its star, with apologies to anyone of French origin for my poor pronunciation. Along with my sincere thanks to Emma Sundberg, for the, of the museum staff for assisting in the photo prep, Mr. James Brusseff, who led the expedition that found LaBelle, and let me use some of his materials in the preparation of this lecture, to Bill Lardis for photos of the vessel reconstruction at the Bullock Museum, and to Charlie Caswith, who's one of our museum ship modelers who recently moved to the East Coast, but who built and contributed a beautiful model of LaBelle that's now on display here afterwards, if you will. It's up here. Please come take a look at it. It's a, it's a beaut. Robert Cavalier Sour de La Salle was born in 1643 in Rouen, France, to a wealthy family. However, as he was not the firstborn son, he was not heir to the family fortune or to the titles. Instead, after finishing school, he joined a Jesuit monastery as a teacher. And he quickly learned that teaching young schoolboys was not an apt choice for his life's profession. La Salle resigned and as an adventurer sailed for New France that we today call Canada, where he became intrigued by the chances to acquire wealth and prestige that awaited entrepreneurial explorers. France's trade and wealth in the New World lay in furs and hides that flowed from the ports of Montreal and Quebec. Unfortunately, these ports froze over from November through March, making them accessible for only six months each year. La Salle knew that the fr early French explorers, Louis Joliet and Father Marquette, had, in 1673, found the Mississippi River and even sailed part way down. Further Indian tribes had told these explorers that the river emptied into a great body of water, which obviously was the Gulf of Mexico. La Salle realized that if the Indians were right, that France could establish a warm water port at the river's mouth, and that furs, hides, and other riches shipped to France 12 months a year. In 1682, he made the voyage from Canada to the Illinois River to the Mississippi to the Gulf, changing a dream to a reality. At the end of his journey, he claimed the Mississippi, its tributaries, and all the waters and land adjacent for Louis XIV, naming this vast area Louisiana. He also claimed all the lands that occupied the center of North America for France. In 1683, La Salle returned to France as an explorer, and he was accorded an audience with Louis to petition for financial backing for a return exploration based on three major objectives. First, he would establish a fort and a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi, and in so doing, maintain France's claim to Louisiana. Second, he would establish trade with the Indian tribes and convert them to Christianity. Third, his fort and colony would be a base for future invasion of Spain's Mexican holdings. And fourth, an unspoken benefit would be the fame and riches the undertaking would, if successful, come to La Salle personally. In retrospect, Louis also saw La Salle's plan as a multifaceted opportunity by claiming all the lands in Central North America from the Gulf to Canada, France could bottle Spain up in New Florida and what is now Texas. 
In addition, he could keep England confined to the East Coast, and hopefully, once his fort was established, he could send soldiers to take over Spain's gold and silver mines. Last, Louis was angry with Spain because of their claim to the Gulf of Mexico. La Salle's expedition would be France's answer to this move for Spanish conquest. After more thought, Louis agreed. He gave La Salle authority to command all the lands of North America, from Fort St. Louis on the Illinois River to the mouth of the Mississippi. He also gave him the naval gunship Le Jolet, a Bark Longueu, which was a light frigate named La Belle, and La Salle himself leased a small catch named Le Saint Francois and the frigate Lamiable. In addition, Louis paid for full ship's crews for all four vessels, a hundred soldiers, and authorized funds to hire coopers, masons, carpenters, and other skilled workers to establish a colony. In total, the expedition now had 300 people and sufficient goods to establish a new colony, as well as to trade with the Indians. La Salle sailed from the port of La Rochelle on July 24, 1684, and five and a half months later, he sighted the Texas coastline. At this point in time, he had only three ships having lost the catch St. Francois to Spanish privateers off to Spaniola. He sailed on for another two weeks. Unfortunately, though the expedition could measure the latitude of their location, the ability to do longitude would not make maritime, the maritime scene for about a hundred more years. In addition, <coughs> La Salle's astrolabe, a predecessor of the sextant, was faulty, and to complicate matters even more, La Salle's map showed that the Mississippi River flowed through the center of Texas. In, in essence, he was flipping coins to determine his position. In reality, he had passed the river's mouth days earlier, and when he did land, he was at the western end of Matagorda Bay. La Salle ordered LaBelle and Lamiable to enter the bay using the buoys placed along the route by the ship's pilot. LaBelle made the transit without incident. The captain of Lamiable, disregarding the assistance of the expedition's pilot and ignoring the boys, ran onto the shoals, firmly and permanently grounding the ship. Supplies were unloaded from the grounded ship until one evening a heavy sea destroyed the vessel and the remaining cargo. In early March, the captain of Le Jolet his mission completed, ready to ship for return to France. The captains of Le Jolet and Lamiable had often argued with La Salle, and based on notes in their ship's logs, both considered them demanding, arrogant, argumentative, prone to making unreasonable decisions, and unable to inspire or lead the crews. Similar comments were found in journal entries of other credible members of the expedition. A psychiatrist looking at these notes today might suggest that LaSalle had a mental problem, a manic depressor. <laughs> when Le Gelet did leave, 120 of the original 300 colonists were on his vessel, leaving the expedition undermanned with compromised supplies. LaSalle, with 180 colonists, sought a temporary and safe site to leave the supplies and the remaining souls while he and a small group set out to find the river's mouth. He expected a two-day journey, which became two months long, with stops among Indian tribes for guidance. Upon his return, he found that LaBelle, his sole remaining ship, had been destroyed by a storm. Further, of the 180 settlers he had left, only 36 were still alive. The others were victims of Indian attacks and disease. With his grand dream of a reality of new colony in the new world in jeopardy, his only recourse was to travel by foot 
to Fort St. Louis on the Illinois River for additional supplies and settlers. An incredible journey of over 1,200 miles. He took 16 men, leaving 20 men, women, and children who all eventually perished. LaSalle's abrasive personality and possible mental problems evidently led to conflicts on the journey, resulting in the revolt of his men who then murdered LaSalle. Now at 43, after 20 years of conquering and colonizing North America's wilderness, LaSalle lay dead, stripped of clothes, stripped of possessions, with his body left for the disposal of animals. <coughs> I'm sorry, a couple of slides appear to have gotten out of hand. At this point, we now lay to rest Rene Robert Sewer de La Salle, the first of the stars of this adventure, along with his place in the history of the exploration of the Mississippi River Delta and France's attempt to colonize Texas. We also fast forward 300 plus years to begin the next chapter of this saga, where plot twists, turns, intrigue, and death once again come into play. The discovery. For the last 150 years, historians have written about LaSalle's ill-fated expedition to Texas and its two lost ships. But finding sunken ships in large bodies of water can take years. Furthermore, it is an incredible challenge and until positioning systems and magnetic <coughs> detection equipment were developed in the 1970s, such a search was a crapshoot. First, few of any maps of this time existed in the U.S. But fortunately, the Texas Historical Commission found a nun, Sister Mary Christine Markowski, a researcher in medieval philosophy who was readying for a trip to France and they persuaded her that while there, she should search for materials related to LaSalle's expedition. Amazingly, her search uncovered copies of maps made less by LaSalle's engineer, Jean-Baptiste Meunier, showing where the colonists landed, where Lamiable had sunk, and other geographic features. Meunier, when he returned to France, carried his maps, charts, and journals with him. Unfortunately, since he left before LaBelle sank, her location still remained a mystery. However, maps created by the Spanish and found in Mexico City pinpointed a place inside Matagorda Bay that was labeled the broken ship. In the 1990s, Texas merged the Historical Commission and the Antiquities Commission. One of this new commission's first projects was to search for LaSalle ships. It was felt that the state funding could be supplanted by private funds if they chose a project of sufficient public interest. Period maps, when combined with recent cartography, showed that Lamiable was probably now resting in treacherous offshore waters. As a result, LaBelle resting in the calm waters of the bay became the natural choice. In June 1995, the Texas Historical Commission's boat, the RV Anomaly, using some very sophisticated magnetometers and maps that were discovered by Sister Marikowski and the maps found in Mexico, they undertook their search. By month's end, 39 sites meriting further investigation have been found. Now, magnetometers will tell you where the wreck may lay but you need scuba divers to determine if you found a vessel, and then further investigation to see if the vessel dates from the 1600s. The team determined the best site. Fortunately, it lay in but 12 feet of water. Unfortunately, the wreck was completely buried in sediment. Feeling by hand, the divers found something, and then a wooden plank was recovered. This was not good news. Wood usually means a recent wreck, especially in the Gulf's warm waters. Teredo worms, a form of mollusk that's indigenous to the Gulf, 
usually bore into wood, weakening, weakening it and eventually destroying it. But then the scuba divers hit pay dirt. Lead musket shots were found. Obviously, this was not a recent wreck. On the second dive, a diver feeling his way along the bay, bay bottom came into contact with a thick, heavy tube topped by two large metal objects, which by feel seemed to wrap around themselves, forming dual metal loops. It was determined that these could well be lifting handles cast onto a ship's cannon at the foundry and used aboard ship to move cannons, cannon barrels, which weigh several hundred pounds. Other artifacts began to appear, a cannonball, a belt, a belt buckle, a fork, even a sword hilt. Obviously and incredibly, on the first dive day, at the first dive site, they had indeed uncovered a very old historic shipwreck, but they could not yet attribute the wreck to a sail. The tube discovered earlier turned out to be a bronze cannon barrel. It was affixed to the wreck by a consecration formed by chemicals in the seawater. The team prevailed on a local area salvage company to voluntarily supply a barge equipped with a crane. Though evidence pointing to a sail was mounting, the archaeologists knew that indisputable proof could be provided from the markings that they would find on the cannon barrel. So divers drilled through the consecration to release its hold on the barrel. They then placed the straps through the metal lifting loops that they had found on the first day of the search. The crane strained, and then with a jerk, the barrel was loose. And for the first time in 309 years, LaSalle's cannon barrel emerged from the bay's bottom to see the light of day. Once clean, there was no question that they had found LaSalle's Lavelle. The canon inscription was the giveaway. Research showed that this was the title that had been granted to Louis de Bourbon, the illegitimate son of Louis XIV and his mistress, Louise de Vallier. The child had been born on October 2nd, 1661, Louis accepted and legitimized him in 1669 by conferring the title of an admiral on him. Louis, Louis further designated this young child to be a major admiral in the French fleet. It seems this acceptance and title were granted in recognition of his mistress's service to the king. Apparently, Service to the king has many definitions of strength. <laughs> in 1684, when LaSalle would have been securing supplies for his expedition, including cannons for Lavelle, the barrels would have borne this admiral's title. So after 309 years on the bottom of Matagorda Bay, Lavelle's watery grave had been discovered. This discovery was hailed as one of the most important shipwrecks in North America and is considered an archaeological find of monumental importance. It's not just another shipwreck. Rather, it's the oldest French shipwreck discovered in the Western Hemisphere. Its enormous historical significance lay on the sales efforts to establish a French colony in Texas and its impact in shaping our state's history. Building a coffer dam. Standard practice in the recovery of old shipwrecks is to excavate the ship over a period of years. Given the historical importance of La Belle, this was not an option. First, it would leave the wreck open to off-season plunder by treasure hunters. And second, once the wreck was uncovered, because it was only in 12 feet of water, if it were struck by a hurricane, it would do incalculable damage. The alternative was to erect a coffer dam surrounding the wreck, which, given the depth of 12 feet of water, was very feasible. Now, a coffer dam is nothing more than a circular wall of steel plates driven into the bottom of the bay, surrounding the wreck, and protruding above the bay's waters. Once this circle of steel is completed, you pump the water out, 
and then you excavate the wreck as if it was found on dry land. The final plan called for two concentric walls of three foot wide steel sheet pilings, each piling 57 feet long and was driven 40 inches into the sandy bottom of Matagorda Bay. The steel walls would be separated by a 33 foot gap filled with sand to absorb leakage aided by sump pumps. A metal roof was built over the top to protect the wreck, its artifacts, the archaeologists, and the workers. Once the water was excavated from inside the dam, initial inspection found a sea of mud but few artifacts. Concern mounted that this sea of mud must have destroyed most of the artifacts. But far from the truth, as the mud was removed, the ship began to appear. The archaeologists found an extraordinary surprise. The burial of ship and cargo in the eroded mud encapsulated these valuable artifacts, resulting in their preservation in an exceptional state. Now, most shipwrecks break up on the surface on their journey to the bottom or once they're resting there. When this happens, the vessel's cargo spills over the sea bottom, where it's subject to decay, erosion, and destruction by wave action. <coughs> LaBelle's cargo was mostly intact. It was still packed in wooden barrels. It was also in wooden boxes. And it was just where the crew had loaded them 300 years earlier. An extremely significant archaeological find had been uncovered. Each bucket of mud hoisted to the top of the coffer dam was placed on a mesh screen and submitted to high pressure water spray to uncover the very smallest of artifacts, beads, pins, rings, etc. Once the artifacts that could be reached were on the surface, the next question was how to remove the hull, a common dilemma in maritime recovery projects. Initially, it was planned to shoot high-pressure water streams under LaBelle's keel, and then insert straps through these tunnels, construct a cradle around the hull, and then lift the wreck in its entirety. An easy solution, but not possible. Engineers who inspected the ship's timbers determined that they were not structurally sound, and if they tried that way to lift it, it would break apart under the strain. The second option, and the one finally chosen, was to disassemble the hull step by step in reverse of the way it was constructed. In so doing, they could examine each and every timber, some of which would forever remain hidden, if the lift and cradle method had been employed. The disassembly began in February 1997 in a series of steps. First, they made detailed drawings and took photos of each timber and its position, showing how the hull looked in the sediment. They also developed the master plan for the conservatory. Each timber was marked and numbered with orange and black plastic cattle ear tags. These were used because of the durability in the tubs of seawater where each piece would be placed, so it didn't dry out and collapse on itself. It was a great idea, but they had to convince the purchasing staff of the Historical Commission that there was indeed a need, a place, and a reason for cattle ear tags when you're conserving a 300-year-old shipwreck. <laughs> Another problem they faced after 300 years of seawater immersion was that the ship's iron bolts and fastenings had either rusted away or become dense consecrations that had permeated into the ship's timbers. Some of the largest frames that were actually attached to the keel were released only by using the force of a crane to actually break the bolts. Last, all timbers and artifacts were transported to Texas A&M's marine lab. They joined all the other artifacts from LaBelle that had been traveling to the lab in two scheduled shipments a week 
beginning from the day when the first items were removed from the ship. The use of the Crawford Dam had allowed the recovery of an incredible number of preserved items, ranging from artifacts dating to the 1600s to brain tissue found in the cranium of a recovered skeleton, of which I will relate more shortly, to 300-year-old insect parts. The ship. Though the one and a half million individual artifacts tell a great tale, the star of this part of the story is the ship itself and all it can tell us about maritime construction in the 1600s. The first question is her name, La Belle, which was translated as beautiful ship. So let us see if she indeed was. Maritime archives in La Rocheport, La Belle's birthplace, include a handwritten document dated 1684. It was titled Proportions of a Bark Lanjou named La Belle. It said the ship was built during May and June of 1684, estimated at 40 to 45 tons. Her length was 54 feet, her beam 14 feet, and these closely approximate the proportions of the recovered vessel. She was considered a light frigate, a three-masted single-deck sailing ship with square rig fore and main mast and fore and aft rig mizzen mast. A single deck. La Belle carried six cannons, and below deck she had five compartments. At this point, the story really gets interesting, because though at first glance, it appeared to the archaeologists that they had a traditional French vessel, while disassembling La Belle, a most unique and puzzling characteristic came to light. The keel and many of the ships main frames were each marked by individual Roman numerals followed by a letter. The obvious question, why? Certainly this alphanumeric code was carved into these major components for a reason other than to add a tradition, an additional twist to our slowly evolving story. Of the hundreds of shipwrecks that have been recovered over time, this was a unique discovery. The archaeologists postulate that at construction, Lavelle had been divided into four sections, four quadrants, with the main mast as the center. Its position was marked with an asterisk. Then archaeologists found that the timbers that fitted from the main mast forward to the bow each had the letter A, which they assume meant avant or front. So each rib in that quadrant had both the letter A along with a sequential Roman numeral. The ribs and keels from the main mast to the stern were designated D, and they assumed that meant derriere, rear or aft. Some frames also included the letter T for triboard, which is starboard in French, and B for bayboard, or port in French. Again, the same nagging question, why? In his earlier explorations, La Salle had carried the component parts to build his exploratory ship, the Griffon, in his flagship. These were later assembled at Lake Erie. The ship sailed down the Illinois River and on to trace the Mississippi to the Gulf. Perhaps, they said, La Salle intended to repeat this exercise. Unfortunately, in this case, Le Jolet, the ship that would have carried the components to build La Belle, was fully loaded with supplies for the expedition. So indeed, here is a fact that will confound the 50 or so members of our museum ship model club, the Gulf Coast Ship Model Society, who totally have thousands of hours of experience building sailing ship models of all sides some scratch-built, some manufactured kits. LaBelle began life as a simple ship model, too. The difference is that, unlike most sailing ship model kits designed on a miniature scale, LaSalle had a scale of one to one. But why carry a full-size kit instead of another fully assembled ship that could transport even more supplies? 
There are documents hinting at the fact that LaSalle did intend to repeat his earlier exploration success. Amy Bull's crew role was headed passage to Canada. In addition, a letter from LaSalle to his mother refers to a change in plan. And instead of a passage to Canada, he said he now plans to go by way of what we call the Gulf. In retrospect, starting from Canada was a far more logical starting point. First, passage from France to Canada, a French possession, was a known, well-traveled route. French captains knew little, if anything, about the geography, tides, pitfalls, pitfalls of the Gulf Coast, or even the location of the Mississippi River's mouth when approaching from the Gulf. In fact, its mouth when coming from the Gulf looks like an overgrown tidal basin. Unfortunately, Louis had other plans. He wanted to access the river by the Gulf because of Spain's king, because Spain's King Philip claimed sole dominion over it. Louis wished he could contest that claim, and the old saying is he who has the gold rules, but when you're the king, you rule twice, once with gold and again with the royal decree. Because of this, the need for an unassembled barque longer was no longer existed, and the ship was assembled and made ready for sea. LaBelle's wreck was a unique time capsule that showed untouched what explorers going to a new land brought with them. Essentially, the million-plus artifacts uncovered represented a kit for establishing a colony in the new world in the 17th century. A rare opportunity to look back in time. <coughs> Excavation of the ship's hold found 85 wooden casks, barrels, and boxes, along with cannons, cannonballs, bar shot, and grinding stones. The boxes, casks, and barrels contained a wide variety of goods, <coughs> including glass beads from Venice, brass pins, rings, and bells all to trade with the Indians. Some barrels held weapons like muskets, gun flints, pistols, gunpowder, and swords, while others were filled with household goods like pewter plates, cups, chargers, kettles, candlestick holders, and silverware. The main hold held 63 casks, seven crates, arranged just as they were when they loaded on LaBelle three centuries earlier. This cargo included several hundred knives and 200 axe blades and other trade items. Navigational goods were also found. Another interesting area of discovery is what the archaeologists found, provisions for daily life. Some of these discoveries included a crucifix, rosary beads, and writing instruments, as well as signet rings, sealing wax, military uniforms, brass and pewter buckles, and sea of backgammon and chess pieces. Even buttons and button loops and woven cloth were in such good condition that silk still retained its color and crochet covers were still intact. One of the two most unusual items recovered was a silver coin. The coin was Roman, dating to AD 69 with the likeness of Ortho, Ortho Caesar. Ortho Caesar overthrew Nero to become emperor. Why would a coin from AD 69 be on the sail ship from the 1600s? The assumption was that it belonged to a crewman who found it on a Roman room in France and carried it for luck. The second unique item was what was called a glass fica. It's about three quarters of an inch long and it was thought that ficas warded off the evil eye and were used in European countries that bordered the Mediterranean. So it too was probably a good luck piece carried by a crewman. In summary, nowhere else has a trove of artifacts of so large a number or so beautifully preserved ever been excavated from a North American archeological site. Skeletons found in the ship. 
At this point, our tale takes an even more bizarre turn. When the archaeologists discovered that LaBelle carried more than cargo in the ship's bow, they came across a human skeleton, and later in the stern, they came upon parts of another skeleton. Now, it's one thing to find objects that colonists brought from Europe. It's quite another to recover the remains of the colonists themselves. For identification purposes, they were labeled individual one, who was found in the stern, consisting of bones for a leg, foot, and parts of a hand. It was assumed that the rest of him was eaten or carried away by predators. In the case of individual two, he was found in the 900-foot jumble of anchor rope in the rope storage locker. Found at the corpse was a small pewter wine and water cup stamped C. Garage. Astonishingly, inside the skull, scientists found an intact brain that was removed for DNA analysis, but the results were inconclusive. Computer technology did develop a facial reconstruction. The French government was contacted relative to a final resting place for Mr. Garage. They responded, he had come to the new world to seek a new life, and he should be buried there. On February 3rd, 2004, in a ceremony with 400 individuals, including state officials, the French ambassador to the United States, and others in attendance, he was buried in the Texas State Cemetery, a final resting place for those who have made significant contributions to the state. It had been determined that this long-forgotten sailor, one of Texas's earliest European colonists, deserved the honored place and was a distinguished residence of this Lone Star State. Conserving the ship and the cargo. The ship and all its artifacts were removed from the wreck site for a last conservation port of call. All were transported to Texas A&M's Conservation Research Laboratory, a leader in the highly specialized field of maritime artifact conservation. Though in appearance, the ship and cargo visually appeared to be much as they did centuries ago. It is found that much of the wood cellulose had disintegrated and been replaced by seawater, which was now the primary agent in maintaining the original cellular shape of the objects. Should these items dry out, the wood cell walls would collapse and the objects would simply turn to dust. Working with Dow Chemical, Texas A&M spent several years soaking LaBelle's parts in silicone oil to replace the seawater. A similar process was done to conserve the Vasa in Stockholm and the Mary Rose in Britain. Given the vast number of artifacts being recovered at the excavation at the bay that had progressed a short four hours away, Researchers and students at the conservation lab were busy cataloging and storing the thousands of items that had been delivered to them on a twice-weekly schedule. Various sized chemical-filled storage tubs were employed, but some artifacts were so large that the lab had to acquire BFI solid waste dumpsters. The hull was transported in pieces and reassembled and conserved as a unit to reduce warping. This meant that the lab had to build a vat measuring 60 feet long by 20 feet wide by 12 inches deep, with mechanism to periodically lower and lift the assembled ship to inspect its structure as it was safe stabilized. Some interesting asides according to the conservators. Before they could reassemble the ship, months were spent cleaning the wood, removing remnants of iron bolts, spikes, tree nails, and then reassembling the top timbers using the coded numbers carved into each component so that all the holes lined up. Buried in the sediment, encasing, in, encasing items like rope coils were thousands of other very small artifacts, including rat bones, insect parts, cockroach egg cases, hair, textile threads, buttons, and other bits of minutia, 
that helped to flesh out the story of life at sea in Lebel. The French make a claim. After the excavation was completed, the government of France filed an official ownership claim for the ship and its contents. <laughs> under, under international law, under international naval law, a Navy ship, no matter its age or location, is owned by the country whose flag it was flying when it went down. Ameri this is unlike the merchandise, mer mercantile stuff for a merchant ship belongs to whoever found it. Navy ships belong to the country. American historians thought the bell had been a gift to La Salle from Louis XIV. Archival research in France provided documentation that the ship was owned by Louis and loaned to La Salle. Madeleine Albright, as Secretary of State, negotiated an agreement with the government of France on March 31st, 2003. In that agreement, the United States conceded the French claim. It gave them the official title to the wreck and its artifacts, but it granted day-to-day -day control in perpetuity to the Texas Historical Commission. <laughs> so just in closing, LaBelle's completed her final voyage. Today she's permanently docked at Austin's Bob Bullock Museum. Microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. LaBelle has completed her final voyage. Today she's permanently docked at Austin's Bob Bullock Museum. She's being assembled and conserved for the last time using the alphanumeric markings on her keel. The discovery, excavation, conservation, and title transfer of LaBelle concludes an epic sea tale that contains adventure, exploration, discovery, and death, with enough bizarre twists and turns to satisfy a Hollywood writer or a maritime sea epic author like Patrick O'Brien or C.S. Forrester. The story begins with the bold dream of an explorer, an adventurer seeking wealth and fame. The finale is written in René Robert Sour de La Salle's death along with the dream for a new world French colony in Texas, along with the discovery, analysis, and interpretation of the colony's artifacts 300 plus years later. The discovery of LaBelle can be found in a comparison of an old proverb that starts for want of a nail. Our proverb starts for want of a ship and concludes that Texas was changed forever. Because of this colony's failure, in this very uncharted land, Spain seized the moment, sent missionaries and soldiers to build missions and forts, Christianized the natives, and indelibly imprinted historic culture on the Lone Star State. Indeed, LaBelle was one small, very pretty ship that went on to change Texas history forever. It's, it's on display right now at the oh, Bullock it's Museum. Finished? Yeah, it's, some of the shots you saw are from uh, the temporary exhibit, but now it's a permanent exhibit. And as I understand, uh, you'll be able to walk on a plastic top that is over Lavelle, so you'll be looking <laughs> down on it as if you were a crewman. Okay. Anyone else? Must have been good lecture. Nobody has any questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 uh, I can't tell you how many were on La Belle. In the expedition, there were 300. There were 100 soldiers. There was full crews that Louis XIV paid for. And then there were a bunch of uh, uh, masons, coopers, journeymen, 
to start a colony. And why did it sink? A uh, storm came up. It, w it was sitting in, in uh, the. It was sitting in the bay, and it should have been okay. And nobody on the expedition seems to know why it sank. So it, it just went down. Yeah. Did LaSalle really think that Oyster Creek was the Mississippi? <laughs> he, he, well, he, he thought that, uh, that the bay was that until he got there. And then he figured he'd missed it by a couple of days. So he started a journey of two days, which ended up being two months. No wonder they killed him. <laughs> Mark? Yes. The reason the ship sank, the, they only had what was called an anchor watch aboard the ship when the storm blew up. They didn't have the sails set. They only had a couple of lines out. When the wind shifted, the ship started moving for shoal water. The few people they had on board had been underfed for a long time and were on the weak side, and they were unable to ship the cables or do anything to keep the ship from running aground. But once it ran aground, the waves did the rest of the damage to the ship. Okay. So, Bert, uh, was there just one gun recovered, and what was the weight of the cannonball? <coughs> I don't know the weight of the cannonball, but they recovered more guns. There's one that they, that's on display, but they have others. Yeah. Is that picture of the statue of LaSalle that you had in your, uh, of the monument to him, isn't that up in Navasota yes, on, on Main Street? So, are, that, so he made it from Matagorda Bay, and his demise was in Navasota. Well, not necessarily. There are a lot of statues of LaSalle oh, in the whole area. It's, it's a tourist stop. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. This ship that went back to France, uh, wasn't that guy considered a, a traitor? He... No, no. His, his assignment from Louis was to help transport the entire expedition to uh, Louisiana. Once that was done, his work was done, he could go back to France. He had 120 people who decided they had it with LaSalle, and they joined this, uh, this voyage back. You mentioned that a lot of the hardware, <clears throat> nails, things like that were obviously damaged. Do they remake those as much as possible then to re-fasten the ship together? Um, oh, you're, you're talking about the, uh, the, the, the steel, uh, the nuts, the bolts, the things like right. that? Yeah, they they do what they need to, but remember that this ship doesn't have to go in the water, so it doesn't have to be as well constructed as the original LaBelle was. So it's a matter of, of just putting it together, put tree, tree nails, which are uh, wooden pegs. Uh, if you're from England, I think they're called tree nails. If you're from the U.S., they're called tree nails, but they serve the same purpose. The hole's drilled, and you just drive them in. Now, normally, when, they, when they're in the water, they swell and fill the hole. Well, I think what we'll do is, if anybody has more questions, they can come on Thursdays and visit with, with Bert. Um, he's here on Thursday mornings till right. about noon, but um, we'd love to, anytime you want to come and visit and have another uh, more more involved conversation. Thank you very very much, and Bert, this is for you. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks so much again. This was really interesting and very comprehensive. Gosh, I know, I'm like, there's a pop test later on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much for being here. <laughs> Oh, just on the road. I had to move the garbage.